Welcome to the Anthro to UX podcast, where you will learn how to break into UX with an anthropology degree. Through conversations with leading anthropologists working in user experience, you will learn firsthand how others made the transition, what they learned along the way, and what they would do differently. We will be discussing what it means to do UX research from a practical perspective and what you need to do to prepare a resume and portfolio. I'm your host, Matt Arts, a business anthropologist specializing in design anthropology and working at the intersection of product management, user experience, and business strategy. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Matt Arts of Anthro to UX. I'm here today with Matt Bernius, and Matt is a principal user researcher for the product Clear My Record at Code for America. So, Matt, thank you uh, for coming on today. I am excited to have you here. I know you've done a lot in the industry to help raise the awareness of UX as a whole and, and really help a lot of people sort of transition into to UX. If I know I've looked at one of your presentations on portfolios in the past. So thanks for everything you're doing and thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. So um, would you start by telling us, you know, how you got into, you know, user research and your path education and maybe leading up to, to sort of, you know, employment? Sure. Uh, I've got to say, buckle in. This is going to be a little bit of a long one. And part of the reason why I like to touch on all of these points is um, I'm, I'm one of those people who believe that so often career paths are incredibly nonlinear. Uh, but when we when we talk about them, we often accidentally make them sound much more linear than they are. So mine begins with my undergraduate. And my undergraduate was actually in uh, print publishing. I was going to school at the Rochester Institute of Technology from uh, 92 to 96. And about halfway through that point, uh, I became really fascinated first with uh, multimedia. So like CD-ROMs and interactive media in that way. And then it, I was kind of in the right place at the right time for also the launch of the, of the web. And so I immediately got into like HTML design, that type of stuff. And um, I lucked into a job at Kodak uh, working on digital cameras, consumer digital cameras. So this was right at the start of digi- consumer digital photography as well. And so uh, I was working on Kodak.com in a variety of roles. But uh, for, for lots of reasons, I was also getting to do a bunch of side work around monitoring online communities as first Usenet and then uh, web communities were starting to form around digital photography. And I had never actually done any social sciences work in my life, let alone research, but something attracted me to it. And I started to get really interested in two sets of questions. One was how were, how was digital photography changing the way that people thought about photography, used pictures, uh, altering communications, even the way that people thought about photos. And then the second term piece was also trying to understand design decisions that were being made at Kodak around the form of a camera or other pieces of that. I can dive into those later if you'd like. I was telling one of my colleagues about these this interest that was developing, and he said, you know, that sounds a lot like anthropology. You should go to the University of Chicago. And I was like, okay, put that in the back of my mind. Uh, after a few years at Kodak, I was starting to get really burnt out and really finding myself increasingly gravitating back towards doing research. And so at that point, I started to do uh, look into grad programs. And actually, the grad program I found was the Master of Arts in the Social Sciences program at University of Chicago. It's a one-year uh, social sciences boot camp. And so without knowing more than that and knowing that I really needed to make a change, I... Uh, I enrolled in the program site on scene, or I, I, um, I uh, applied to the program site on the scene. Mm-hmm. And I got accepted, and it was amazing. Uh, so at about the age of 30, I drove to Hyde Park, and you know, you hit University of Chicago, and you're like, I've been accepted into Hogwarts. Like, what am I doing here? Uh, and went through a program. Uh, uh, their, their intro class was... You basically had one week to pick up Marxism because the next week you were moving on to Durkheim, the next week you were moving on to Weber. So it was like this intense experience. Uh, But I got through it. I really enjoyed it. I got a chance to work with uh, folks like Michael Silverstein and really move into uh, linguistic, semiotic, and media anthropology. 
graduated from that, and my plan was to go back to Kodak uh, and work in the research labs. But by this point, Kodak was already on its downward trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I found myself uh, teaching, actually, in uh, the program I graduated from at RIT, uh, and began to get interested in topics like open source. Uh, in, I actually helped put together an undergraduate research lab there. They offered me a tenure track position, but it was contingent on me getting a PhD. So at that point, I decided to go back to school, again, take a leave from absence and kind of looking at uh, what was available to me in the Rochester area, because my wife uh, has family here and also had a much better job than I did at the time, ended up uh, going to Cornell and enrolling in Cornell's cultural anthropology program. And... Um, also working across uh, taking classes in their STS, communications and information science programs. And to be honest, uh, Cornell was not a particularly great experience for me. I had some kind of classic grad school issues. My uh, The person who was supposed to chair my committee left in my first semester. But uh, additionally, all of my work and all of my trajectory had really been moving me in more of an applied uh, direction. And uh, Cornell's program is excellent. The faculty there is great, but it was very much a high theory piece. And mm -hmm. uh, trying to live in both Ithaca and Rochester, commuting back and forth, just became incredibly taxing. I did not really understand self-care at the time. And eventually, uh, I left the program due to a just a breakdown. I kind of and I'll be honest, the other piece that was going on at that time was we were already hearing discussions about the precarity of academic positions. I was looking mm -hmm. at finishing my PhD in my late 30s, early 40s, and then the thought of doing multiple postdocs to try and find a tenure track position if one existed just uh, was not appealing to me. So I spent about two and a half years really recovering from that. I was slowly rebuilding my career. Uh, working on small uh, small research gigs, trying to build up a portfolio, also taking whatever work I could. I was an extra in one of the Spider-Man movies, but not one of the good ones. Um, and eventually um, ended up taking a job uh, at a pet supply store, doing retail work, which was challenging. <laughs> I, I literally started on my, I want to say my 39th birthday, but I also really learned a bit about retail space and actually a lot of stuff would go on to inform a lot of the way that I thought about space and other pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I was still looking for positions. And uh, one of the restrictions was that Rochester, New York, it's uh, Western New York is a small city. We don't have a lot of options here. Uh, remote work wasn't quite the same as it was in other places. And I didn't feel like I was in a position to really ask my wife who's was uh, sustaining and supporting us to move to another location. Mm -hmm. However, um, I got lucky in that some of my colleagues from Kodak had uh, had left Kodak and were working at a um, design firm that needed some additional qualitative research. So I had I literally went through three separate interviews months apart with them, and it was always the case that they thought they would have work and then the contract fell through or they didn't lend the client, mm -hmm. but eventually there was the right mix of they had a client, they were able to bring me on in a contract position to do that work. Uh, and then just building that up allowed me eventually to step into a full-time position. And I ended up working for them for about three and a half years, working primarily in the medical, the industrial application space and financial applications. Uh, ultimately, changes happened in the UX industry that led to our office being closed, uh, and I had a choice of relocating to another city and opted against that. By that point, I had built up enough of a client portfolio that I was able to uh, basically strike out on my own for a bit, as well as transition and begin to do work within the tech for good space, originally mm -hmm. with uh, Mozilla around or the Mozilla Foundation around their campus project. It was, again sort of a perfect gig that fit into, they were trying to understand uh, how open source is taught on college campuses. As I mentioned, that was something I was involved in. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah. And then after about a year of contracting and, and just hustling for my own work, an opportunity came up with a past, uh, Effective was the name of the design firm I was working at, mm -hmm. at, 
a past effective client named Measures for Justice. Uh, and that was my introduction into the, um, the criminal legal system space. And so I did work uh, basically building a, uh, MFJs or Measure for Justice's first qualitative research and then really assisting them in uh, leveling up their entire UX and product approach. And after about two years, I was kind of facing a career uh, junction in that I had, if I continued with MFJ, I would really be moving more and more into the product management space, which was something that I was interested in, but I wasn't quite sure if that was really the direction that spoke to me. The other thing about MFJ was that we were working in the criminal legal system space, but largely with uh, people on this, actors on the state side. So prosecutors and district attorneys, judges and that. I was really interested in moving over and doing more work with system impacted folks, uh, formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, and so this opportunity came up at Code for America to work remotely, which was perfect. Yeah. And so just at the start of uh, COVID-19, I transitioned from Measures for Justice to Code for America. I was one of the first uh, two people brought on fully remote, uh, not uh, doing any in-person stuff. And so my last year has been really coming up to speed on uh, how to do work in the middle of a pandemic with people who are already experiencing a lot of adversity and trauma and trying to figure out how to ethically work within that space and make things better for them. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for that. There's a lot to dig in there and certainly want to come back to Code for America. But the first thing I want to comment on is, you know, you made you made the statement that oftentimes we retell everything in this sort of nice linear fashion, which is true. But what's also true is we often leave out, you know, a lot of the struggle or the bad stuff. So it almost just seems like it was this continuous set of wins, mm -hmm. um, you know, in retrospect. And so I, I thank you for, for sharing, you know, your entire story with the, with all of the ups and downs, because I'm on this podcast, getting a lot of feedback from people who, you know, are trying to make, break it in and they're talking about their struggles. And so I know they really appreciate hearing from others, you know, the real life sort of journey that they took and both the good and the bad. So thanks again for sharing that. The, um, you know, you, you brought up one thing about the PhD that is, is particularly interesting, which, um, or a few things, maybe two things. So one is there are, you know, just no, there's very few, you know, tenure track jobs these days, right. And which is why we're seeing so many people, from PhDs, to, you know, down uh, making the transition, you know, and and from really early from bachelors already just planning to go into something like UX. Uh, but you also brought up, you know, the the problem actually a problem that I'm having with uh, I'm I've been looking at some PhD programs and I'm struggling to find an anthropology program that would be um, receptive to applied work at the mm -hmm. you know at at a at that level and. I have yet to find something, so I myself am considering, you know, doing a different type of program. Um, but it it does bring up the need, really, for you know, I think it brings up the need for programs to be thinking about this work, right? We we are seeing most people go out, you know, move out of academia and into business, mm -hmm. and so there really needs to be a conversation about that. I'm not suggesting we do that today. I just want to sort of, you know, bring it up again. I. I Rachel Fleming had touched on it in her episode, and I just, for anybody that's listening out there, I want uh, maybe any faculty listening to possibly realize that, you know, there there is a greater need and we need to be talking about applied work at the PhD level um, mm -hmm. and really supporting that. But so moving, moving beyond those comments, um, so your work, you know, with effective, so you were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, sort of um, lack of you know, portfolio leading maybe up to that, but then after, you know, you had some effective work, you had a portfolio, so it became easier. So in there, you're talking about some challenges. What other challenges were you having, you know, making, you know, a transition out of your, you know, Kodak experience into, say, the effective phase? Sure. Uh, well, to be honest, the, the first and probably largest one was location. Uh, so again, uh, it, if you are in that early state, in the before times, I should say, because <laughs> this is, um, you know, COVID has really shifted a lot of stuff. And honestly, I'm not sure where a lot of this is going to shake out. Mm -hmm. The 
the reality is if you're trying to break into an industry or, or into this into this field, uh, let's leave industry aside, being in a location where there's a high demand for those roles uh, and, and also the chance to not just uh, a high demand, but many organizations that are trying to hire that talent is really critical. Uh, and so I was in sort of, I don't want to say a catch-22, because the reality is when I talk to people about transitioning, we we have to talk about like family situation, what's their sure. stability, uh, do you have the ability to have someone else provide for, you know, uh, not just food, but insurance, all of those key factors. I was exceptionally lucky in that I had a, my, my wife is a federal clerk. So she was earning a very good salary. We had healthcare through her. She also, as an, as another factor has an autoimmune condition. So the option of even being without insurance for us was not really a possible option. So from that perspective, it's like, yeah, it would be great if we could have relocated to the Bay Area or to uh, New York, Chicago, someplace where there's a much greater demand for the skill set. That would have helped my job search significantly, um, but that was not uh, was not an option for us. So those are some of the factors that also come in. I think um, beyond that, honestly, part of what I was also dealing with was, and I... I'm using this term very specifically, um, trying to figure out how to tap into support networks when I was also feeling uh, some degree of trauma and shame for not being able to complete a PhD program. So I think mm. that slowed everything as well, because I was going through a lot of grieving for that, a lot of recovery around that. Uh, and so in some respects, I think I could have found some options sooner if I had reached out and uh, and talked with folks who I was just really not in the right mind frame to do that, so that that's another piece as well is is tapping into networks. Um, but I think the the real truth is, and most of the folks I know who've been through this process, it's just finding that first gig, and we know that for um, the UX Research Collective out of Toronto, just produced uh, their annual report on the state of the UX research industry. And um, it's, we do know that currently getting the first gig is very, very difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's not something that, that sometimes even in a city with a lot more folks happens overnight. Uh, some folks I, I've been working with, it's taken up to two years. The good news is once they get that, it seems like everything then smooths out, but it, it is definitely a challenge. Yeah, for sure. And so there are still a lot of people, well, there's increasingly many people who are in regions which, you know, still have a, maybe an immature or, you know, emerging sector. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, COVID has changed the dynamic with online jobs, but um, we can presume that still, you know, many you know, some of those jobs will go back to in-person in the future, mm -hmm. you know, at least some portion. And even, you know, for those who are applying to online jobs, there is still the challenge of getting your foot in the door. And so, you know, I'm curious maybe to dig into from the from the people you've worked with or the people that you're talking to in the industry, do you think there's anything in particular that, you know, either helped you or is helping mm -hmm. other people right now to, to find that first gig? Yeah, a few things. Uh, so, so one thing, one thing I would say, and I, I try to counsel everybody, is to actually treat the job search like it's a, like it's an ethnography. So uh, the amazing thing about our our background in anyone, not just anthropology, but really command of a qualitative academic training background, is an ability to really look at and learn a new field. And so part of it is. Um, for a lot of people, it's it's helpful also to depersonalize the search by adding that extra layer of research to that. So some of that's uh, going out and understanding where folks congregate. So one of the things I also really didn't do until I got hired by Effective was actively engage online. I was kind of lurking in Epic stuff or on mm -hmm. 
uh, things like the Ethnography Hangout Slack or other various channels, but I wasn't actively participating. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still great to lurk, but feel free to reach out and, and do some of that work. I think additionally, it's also looking to things that are, uh, that are adjacent to UX that might also offer some interesting possibilities. So one of the areas that I'm, uh, that I've been really focusing on a lot over the last few years, uh, three years, is the area of service design, which is similar to UX, but often plays in different spaces. Uh, and so it's a bit more well-known in Europe that we're seeing, especially in the civic space uh, and in the medical space, it's becoming more commonly talked about here in the U.S., and there's a lot about um, service design. Uh, one of my former colleagues, the, the great Tamara Hale, uh, has written about this and published a few pieces on this about how service design's really ecosystem view of the world fits really nicely in the way anthropologists think of that. So mm -hmm. I think it's also really easy to focus on one thing like UX to the detriment of perhaps seeing other, other possibilities. The other one that I mentioned, and again, it wasn't necessarily on my, where I chose to take my career, at least right now, is perhaps even looking beyond research uh, towards things like product management. And um, because often, especially in smaller areas, product management still involves research. It still involves thinking about uh, your your user needs or your 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 customer needs in a way that is very anthro driven. Interestingly, it also really requires a lot of thinking about organizational culture and how do you translate all of these uh, complex groups uh, of needs together. So mm -hmm. beyond just UX, there are some other areas that I think anthropology fits really well into if you're looking to work in that section of the applied in this section of the applied space. Yeah, agreed. Now, and now you, I think you just said in there, but you didn't look at any of those at the time, right? And admittingly, you know, service was very mature at that point, but so you, you didn't consider anything else but UX? That was so yeah, what you were... It, uh, totally. Um, I was really focused on design at the time uh, and, and that type of research. Honestly, so this was like 2012, 2013. So also the space has changed. Um, yeah. Really, we've gone through at least one, if not two, generation uh, generations of professionalization within the, within all of these spaces. So, to some degree, this is also a rapidly evolving area. So, the state of the industry at the time where I broke broke in is different than the state of the industry now. Yeah. One other thing I'll also say is I think. Um, it really benefits folks making the transition to dive a little bit more just into the concept of design. Uh, and, I, and I think most anybody who's listening to this is already most likely not thinking about design as just purely aesthetic. But I think um, often folks will find that there are certain types of design like interaction design or overall experience architecting that are not necessarily pushing pixels or Require the type of design skills that, that folks often think about. And there is a space for, I think, someone coming out of a research area to, much like I was mentioning with product management, do work in those areas too. Okay, good. And so when you were going through your journey, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you suggested that reaching out to your network, you know, is, is valuable and that you were maybe shying away from that given like, you know, what happened coming out of the PhD program. But when you maybe did start the process of networking, what did you learn from that? <laughs> so, um, I, I will share this, this story. Uh, the first, my first actual real engagement with the broader researcher space beyond uh, being active on the Ethnography Hangout Slack and a few other Slacks for a number of years was I had never been able to get to an Epic. And just after I decided to make the decision to leave uh, leave Effective, Epic happened to be held in Montreal that year. Um, and so I, uh, I'm like, well, you know, my new boss is kind of a jerk, but he always approves my travel. So I gave myself permission to 
drive up to Montreal from Rochester and attend it. And it was sort of like, I'm in there and I'm just kind of talking to people. And within a few minutes, I ran across Sam Ladner, who's somebody I had always corresponded with on Twitter for years, but never really had a conversation with. And she's like, oh my God, you're Matt Bernius. And I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> and she's like, you know, I just really appreciate uh, talking with you. And it's great that you're here. And it's great that you're part of this community. And that it was just like my, my heart grew three sizes at that moment. And then after that, um, just within a few more moments, like I ran into Melissa Sefkin, met her in person for the first time. And she said, oh my God, you're Matt Bernius. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and she's just like, you know, I just really appreciate how much you're helping people. And I uh, all but started to cry on the spot because it was like this suddenly feeling like I was part of a community that I I had been um, preventing myself from being a part of. Yeah, I, I think it's just getting out and just, I, I hate to say it's as simple as talking to people, but it is kind of that. I think that may also be why I, I make the recommendation of treating the job hunt more like an ethno ethnographic research or a research project, just to kind of give yourself permission to ask questions of others uh, and, and to do that. I think one of the other key things, this is a somewhat unfair thing to say, but it is also somewhat accurate, is I think there's definitely a mode of academics, if not anthropology, uh, sometimes it's kind of triple A, like old school, where really you build a career by selectively picking fights. You know, you, you figure out somebody that you can have an argument with. Sometimes it's a genial one and generative. Sometimes it can be pretty knocked down, but it's, it's definitely, uh, folks can be guarded in that way, especially mm -hmm. intergenerationally. Whereas uh, I think an aspect of the design and business space is that everybody there's a good chance that everybody's going to work with everybody at some point. And so those types of things in my experience don't happen in the same way. If, if anything, I think sometimes um, the Epic space, and this is actually something that Melissa had commented on at that, um, at that Epic and it stuck with me can almost be sometimes too congenial. Maybe there's a, a need for a little bit more productive friction sometimes to kind of bat around different theories, but Ultimately, it's a much more, in my experience, welcoming space uh, once once you start to talk to folks in it. And I would say that's the same is true um, for a lot of the other mailing lists or local organizations that are out there. So um, the other piece, I'm sorry, I'm going on a little bit, that's available now that I wish I had known about, and, and again, some of this is location-based, is... There are volunteer or volunteer project opportunities, uh, whether we're talking about like a Code for America brigade, if one is in your city, to currently uh, a number of the people that I've been talking to are in the job search are doing things with uh, USDR, US Digital Response, which is a uh, volunteer project actually connected to Code for America and that uh, the person who started USDR, one of them, Jen Palka, was also the person who started Code for America, but... Mm. It's bringing experts in to assist uh, with tactical projects at federal and state levels. So I know that they've got some uh, user research needs within that. And so it's a great way to get some piece portfolio pieces. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about volunteering. I have strong feelings about it. I think it's important. I also think it's something you need to do, be very selective about and think very carefully before you uh, do too much of for a variety of reasons, but I should let you ask another question. No, no, thanks. And so, yeah, so let's, we'll come back to volunteering for sure. Um, you know, I, I, I know people have varying beliefs on that, but since you brought up Code for America there, I'd like to maybe jump into that work a bit. So, you know, when you're at Measure for Justice, you said more or less you're kind of doing work on, you know, I'll just say on behalf of the state, if you will, mm -hmm. right? And now you've sort of pivoted to doing really work on, you know, behalf of the people who are impacted by the state. And so that's obviously a big change. It's a, you know, mm -hmm. a very big change in perspective and a uh, very big change in, in arguably impact, 
Right. And so I'd be curious, you know, there's, there's a lot to unpack in here, but getting into that, what were maybe, you know, some of the, you know, the, the learnings that you went through, you know, when starting to work, you know, with people who have been impacted by the system, because, you know, for me, it's not a space I've worked in at all. And I'm sure there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a host of, you know, privacy issues, ethical issues. And so I'd like to kind of, with you, maybe dig into those kinds of problems of UX research. Sure. I'd love to. Um, I think uh, part of it was honestly, it was a new space for me to work in. So what led me to that was right around the time, uh, last fall of 2019, I attended my first uh, conference put on by System Impacted Folks uh, with the Free Her organization. And it was um, really life-changing. I have been, I think like a lot of folks, uh, somebody who's always either studied sideways or studied up. So uh, I've always done most of my work around and within professional communities. So mm -hmm. really for the first time being in, um, in a community and, and being welcomed to do, uh, to talk to and begin to do some research within um, an impacted community was was very, very humbling for me uh, and really made me have to think about, you know, cultural competency, what is my authentic self, especially, you know, owning my position as a cisgendered middle-aged white guy in a conference that is, you know, largely uh, black and people of color, largely, largely women, and who the vast majority had done time on the inside. And so, that happened just around the same time as Epic, and at Epic, that Epic, I also sat through a presentation uh, given by folks from Public Policy Lab on uh, trauma-informed practices in their research and design work, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of trauma-informed methods, but it was immediately, like, I, I got the concept, and I could immediately see the importance of them, so... Part of the last year has been really trying to understand what it means to conduct research uh, and conduct research remotely within communities that are experiencing different levels of trauma. Part, uh, some of the challenges with that is one, recruiting, thinking through how do you actually recruit folks uh, in communities that may uh, not have the best internet access. And so that's actually something we're constantly struggling with. The way we would do it when we'd be on the ground is completely different than um, some of our options for recruiting when we're not doing that. Uh, it's also really understanding technical limitations. So a lot of times people think about doing uh, research during, co during COVID using Zoom, but we're working with folks who may have data, but may be on a limited data plan. And so asking them to Zoom is not necessarily going to be good for the uh, useful for them. So really, it's trying to figure out how do we meet folks where they are. Compensation is another real challenge. I think um, for a variety of reasons, like like a lot of organizations, Code for America tr tries to do compensation via gift cards, and we're also finding some of the limitations of that. Or we had we had had a gift card system that was that seemed to be working really great for us, but we hit challenges like um, if you're uh, if the the gift cards required online activation and questions about like home addresses and sometimes the populations that we're working with uh, you know are experiencing homelessness or mm -hmm. or at least uh, housing insecurity and so they're moving around a lot and that's a real challenge or simply activating something online so we've also been experimenting with mobile payments using Venmo or those types of pieces but on the flip side, there are also challenges around accounting with that to make sure that it's not appearing like we're doing money laundering if we're ever audited. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's negotiating the interview. And, and I'll, I'll, for most of my time at Code for America, I've been focusing on people who have really... Um, let me take a step back. What we're working on at Code for America is record expungement. So criminal records are... Uh, which I believe the, the, going, the going number right now is approximately one-third of the American population has a criminal record. 
you don't need to go to jail or prison to have a criminal record. Just simply having an arrest is something that will follow you. And so depending on the job type and background check, uh, having a criminal record can prevent people from accessing jobs, accessing housing, social services, any number of things, as well as um, various, various licensing. So Clear My Record is about uh, helping people clear their records, to uh, expunge their records, or uh, I'm going to say clear because I'm going to say clear, and we won't get into why. <laughs> Um, so I've been talking with a lot of folks who have been much further in their reentry process, have typically cleared some or all of their records. My latest round of research was actually involved with people who have just reentered the community, who just uh, got out uh, from COVID uh, due to COVID or other things in last November. And uh, I can share that I think it was this past Thursday, I just had a gut punch of an interview that I actually, um, we pair, we, we try to pair our interviews. So I had another researcher with me and I had to ask her to take over a few times because I was just so knocked back by some of the things that were being shared with me that, um, I wasn't capable of continuing the interview. And so preparing for that or thinking about how do we not re-traumatize somebody during an interview is another component of the work. So... Um, in there, you know, when talking about the interview, I'm curious to know, you know, obviously there is some, well, actually first, let me, before asking that, how many people, when they come out say in your most recent round of research are even aware that they can have the record cleared? Is that a common understanding or is that something you're also educating on? No, uh, most folks have heard about Record clearance within the state is something that's discussed on the inside or uh, often because they're, uh, these folks are involved with reentry organizations. It's something that gets discussed there. The bigger challenge is that depending on the state, um, and this is actually, let me back, back up for a sec to, to provide a little bit more information. We talk about having a criminal justice system. We prefer to say criminal legal system because of often there's a distinct lack of justice within the system. Mm, that's a good way of saying uh, it. And so... Based on TV, that sort of stuff, we typically think that there's a unified criminal legal system inside the United States. But in reality, there are at least 51, uh, one for each state, because every state has different statutes and a federal level. But really, the application of the system happens at the county and large municipality level. So there's over 4,000 distinct criminal justice systems within the United, uh, excuse me, criminal legal systems within the United States. And that's before we even get to the fact that it's an adversarial system. There's lack of data sharing, all of the th that stuff. So this is a system that very much resists scale in the way that uh, people often think about it. So folks on the inside hear about record clearance. They they will come outside. They, they'll probably hear about through reentry or through some of the the community-based organizations they're working with. The problem with it is often it takes years uh, to qualify for record clearance, uh, which means that you have folks re-entering the community who are desperate to try and change their lives, but also have to basically change their lives in order to qual uh, qualify for the record clearance that will allow them to actually change their lives. I can give you a really good example of this, the Catch-22s that are created by this. One of our interviewees had a nursing certification, uh, not um, like home health care, uh, their home health care certification prior to becoming system involved. After re-entering the community because of licensing, essentially that license was suspended. For the, so for the last few years, they haven't been able to actually practice what they had because of their uh, their uh, charges. They're reaching the point where they can actually qualify for an expungement. Uh, and because of COVID, their state put in an emergency, uh, an emergency order that for the nursing homes and for certain types of healthcare jobs, they're suspending um, licensing restrictions. So during COVID, during this emergency state, uh, state this individual is actually able to practice their work like they could prior to um, uh, prior to going inside. However, if they don't get their expungement by the time that emergency order ends, they're back to square one. 
Yeah. And they're and they're no longer going to be able to do the job they've been doing since the start of the pandemic. And making things even worse, because expungements are considered civil law, not criminal law, uh, the courts and, and justice system is extremely backlogged on processing them, which means that the very situation that is allowing this person, the arbitrary situation that's allowing this person to start practicing again, is also more or less creating a situation where they may not be able to get their expungement in time to continuing practicing once that, that order goes out. And these are also the type of stories that you hear that you get to get a sense, even for somebody who's doing better than some of the folks, about just this underlying level of trauma that I keep talking about and the challenges and stress that is created by this. Yeah. And, and so, you know, so thanks for sharing all that. And just to maybe add on that, you know, and, and correct me if, if I get anything wrong, but mm -hmm. you originally started this program in a way where you know, people could basically sign up, go through the process. It was lengthy. It was one off. It was basically not scalable. You've now moved to more of an automated process for some counties in the U.S., you know, for some for, uh, for some laws that um, Prop 64, I know, particularly I saw. And so now you're doing this at scale. But um you're hoping to expand, but of course, with all of this, there's obviously the research to make sure it's human centered. Yep. So to tie this now back to the interview, you know, I'm curious to maybe related to the ethics conversation, this seems like the perfect place to have a more formalized informed consent process, which is often absent in industry, right? To have, you know, a more elaborate I mean, almost academic-like process. I'm not saying an IRB, but just mm -hmm. something that is a little bit more um, transparent and, and you know, helping, you know, them understand their options, you know, certainly understanding that, you know, related to trauma, that if they wish to mm -hmm. to pause or stop the interview, they have the right. So you may want to maybe talk about how you're handling that that informed consent process. Great question. So we handle consent in a number of ways, uh, and it's really important for us. One of the things I think, generally speaking, is that often on the industry side, the focus of the consent process really is about getting rights to use the material, whereas we really try to embrace, like you said, a much more um, academic or ethical uh, type of consent that's much more focused on the protection of the folks we're working with. So one thing I'll say even before anything else is that also begins with us simply when we're trying to do research, asking, is this a question that we need to ask? Is this research that we need to do? Or are we doing research for the sake of research? Mm -hmm. Once we establish it, is the research that we need to do? And we've put some thought into what's the right demographic mix and other, uh, other mix of folks there. We will, um, we'll begin the process in a few ways. So, so one of the things that we'll do is if we're being given the names of folks for, uh, to recruit through a partner, especially if they're um, system impacted folks, we will try to communicate with them, but we're going to also, we're going to make very sure that um, we're not putting anything in email or even a text that could in any way um, reveal sensitive information about them, especially if they're using a shared device or a shared email account, which we know happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Once we actually move into the consent process, uh, the first thing that we do is we actually share the topics that we're going to be talking about, or in my case, often the questions ahead of asking someone to give consent for the for conducting the interview. That's along with explaining um, wh what the research is, how the research will be used, uh, and additionally, what are folks' rights during the research. Now, when I say like rights during the research, it's things like um, they can leave the research at any time. They don't have to answer any question that they that they don't want to. In fact, in cases where I give them the questions ahead of time, I give folks the op opportunity to actually guide the conversation versus me. You know, which, which of those would you like to answer first? Are there any issues with that? Uh, if we are recording, we let folks know that they can ask us to stop recording at any time. Uh, folks are also able to always reach out to us during the interview, after the interview, to say, I prefer if you, don't, you don't use a portion or all of the interview. Mm -hmm. We um, make the final findings available to the folks that we work with, so they have a sense of that. Sometimes we actually try to bring them into the process and have them comment on what they see there. Um, additionally, and, and very importantly, whenever we do not... Uh, 
use pseudonyms or anything else. We will only anonymously share quotes and um, really distance them as much from the individual because it's about the situation that they're talking to, not the person who's speaking in those cases. Also, as a strategic choice, we always compensate at the beginning of interviews. So that way people don't feel like they're trapped talking to us and that they can leave if they need to. Yeah, I really like that. Um, a few other things we do is we'll, um, we'll often do verbal consent in part because um, while it's great to have them sign something or fill out a form, we also know that for a lot of the pe folks we're working with, that can create high degrees of stress. So we give people the option of either filling out or doing a verbal consent. Mm -hmm. When we do the consent, uh, we'll do a couple things. One, we'll talk through, um, again, the purpose of the research. First, we'll then ask for our levels of permission. So one, can we get affirmative consent that we're able to conduct this interview? Two, that we're able to take notes from the interview. And three, that we're able to record the interview for note-taking purposes. And we respect if somebody says no to anything after conducting the interview, we'll work around that. The second thing is we very clearly talk them through how the research is potentially going to be used and get their explicit consent to one, share internally with Code for America and with uh, then to share externally with partners and government folks. And again, this is all a sharing anonymous quotes. Yep. And third, uh, to give us permission to include these in advocacy articles and, um, and potentially social media posts. Again, folks can opt to participate in all three of those or any one of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, if folks are interested in this, uh, one of the things our my team has done is publish a uh, qualitative research guide that really talks through our team's approach um, to qualitative research, including things like consent, permissions, that type of stuff. It's a free uh, free download from the Code for America site, and I'm sure Matt can link to it. I'll give sure. him the information after. Uh, so you can kind of take a look at the way we're approaching some of these things. The, the other piece that's in there is also our compensation uh, scales, which I think is really important for us to talk about too. Yeah. So why don't you, why don't you dig into that then? Sure. Um, what we we're we're trying to compensate, uh, we try not to, we, first, we always try to talk about in terms of we're paying for these individuals expertise. So as a general rule of thumb, unless there is some stipulation like a government, uh, individual, an individual in government who cannot uh, take money from us for some reason, we always compensate for our interviews. That includes with the community-based organizations we're working with whenever possible, because this may not be that individual's job and we're asking them to take an hour out of their time. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, we charge um, uh, 25 or, or we compensate $25 for every half hour. We also always round up. Uh, so our uh, our hour long interview rate currently is fifty dollars. If we go over the hour, then it goes up to seventy five. Two hour interview, a uh, hundred dollars. If it's going to be longer than that, we have a few other scales that are used. Or if we're doing something shorter, like an intercepted inter a quick intercept interview, it might go down to five. But uh, the key thing is that, especially now in pandemic times, it's really critical for us to make sure that we're getting folks. Uh, compensated for sharing your expertise. Sure. Great. So, so you've talked through the process of sort of, you know, bring them in to the research activity and talked a little bit about participating with them on crafting that and, you know, giving them the rights to, to opt out as, as needed. But how about we dig into what the actual interview looks like? You know, you, in some of your literature, you talk about trauma-informed research, trauma-informed mm -hmm. design, uh, obviously, some of uh, presumably some of the stories that come up, you know, are are trauma, you know, are are source of trauma for the participants, mm -hmm. and so navigating that can be, you know, well, obviously we need to show respect and, and care and concern, but we also, you know, that that also creates some ethical issues for us, even right. So you mm -hmm. want to maybe talk about, uh, you know, your approach to trauma informed research. Sure. And I'm still very, very uh, early in my cycle on this. Uh, my colleague, for example, at Didi Joshi has published a really beautiful piece on uh, conducting research from a healing perspective that, again, we'll, I'll give a link to. It's, it's great to look through. But um, the trauma-informed framework comes out of initially uh, medical care, uh, specifically 
looking at skills from social work and other areas and bringing them into our space. And one of the things we have to acknowledge is that um, research and interviews, especially when we're working in um, spaces like this, often uh, can have a very therapeutic feel to it or, or something that's similar to a psychotherapy session. In fact, there's a really wonderful piece called Practicing Without a License that looks at that and really complicates things. So as I mentioned, one of the first things that we try and deeply think about is, is there a different way of getting this information, whether we're working with a secondary so source or something else that um, wouldn't require us conducting an interview that risks re-traumatizing someone? Mm -hmm. uh, Chicago Beyond has an amazing um, piece on this called, uh, it's a series of pamphlets that are called Why Am I Always Being Researched? that really talks about research within black and urban communities that are constantly having often white folks like me coming in and asking them the same questions over and over again. So that's kind of step one is being aware of that piece. Uh, step two is understanding that trauma can manifest itself in different ways for different people. And so one person can talk about their criminal history without seemingly experiencing any trauma, whereas somebody else, it can immediately trigger um, the, the re-traumatization process. So it's, it's treating everyone as an individual and giving them the tools within the interview framework to empower themselves. So for example, one of the things uh, we'll do, I'll do when I'm, when I'm giving the initial research uh, talk through is, for example, say, the research we're doing is about uh, record clearance or expungement. It's not about your individual criminal history. So you're in control of how much you want to talk or not talk about that. I'm not going to ask any direct questions about it. If you feel that it's necessary to um, make your point, I welcome that from you. However, there, you're under no obligation to share any of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it also requires me to sometimes make some judgment calls about is somebody going on a tangent that isn't going to inform the research and is potentially risking their health or their mental health or also my mental health. And so sometimes that can be if somebody is seemingly experiencing uh, trauma and challenge because we're often doing this over the phone uh, and without that video input is kind of listening for changes in their voice, changes in their tenor, increases of stress is then trying to think through moments that I can break the flow, um, you know, saying, wow, what you've shared with is uh, really, really heavy. I think it would be great. I need to take a moment and just do a little bit of grounding breathing. Why don't we do this together or create that type of opportunity? Mm -hmm. It also means preparing resources and having resources at hand so that if uh, someone, for example, is having challenges accessing legal aid in their area, that I can recommend them to legal aid groups. Or if someone seems like they're in a mental health crisis, being able to recommend them to that. It's also accepting that I'm building a relationship with this individual, which it's also offering, you know, if it's helpful, I am happy to make the call with you or uh, assist you in filling out a form, doing those pieces, uh, realizing that there's, there's that type of um, relationship being built in this. It's also realizing that I'm not a social worker and knowing where it's necessary to uh, to get someone to professional help, uh, but also ending the interview early, doing whatever it takes to try and do that. Mm -hmm. The other piece of trauma-informed care is also being aware of the impact of vicarious and secondary trauma on me. And so, like I said, having somebody along in the interview who can take over when I'm not able to do that, or um, in addition to having a therapeutic and uh, mental health infrastructure for myself as a team on a biweekly basis, we get together. It used to be in person over at a coffee shop. Um, but for what we call Friday feels where folks are able to kind of decompress and share challenging aspects that come out of interviews or any aspect of our work mm -hmm. uh, with a team and uh, having that there as well. The other, um, the other important piece is also, being really clear with what may or may not come out of the research. So if we're asking people to comment on the, on the conditions of their city, and these, the, this feedback is gonna be passed to local government, it's, we don't have necessarily that ability to ensure 
that what they say is going to be handled. And so being really honest up front, this is how it's going to be used. We hope it will have this effect, but it may not. And so um, articulating with the folks we're working with in this more um, one way interview mode uh, of what what's the real impact of the research going to be is very important. Additionally, a lot of our work is to move in more of a participatory direction where, again, we can shift more and more towards community empowerment, towards less extractive research models and, um, you know, uh, finding ways to build that into the research. Again, getting back to is interviewing the right way of, of getting to what we're looking to do. Mm -hmm. So as a follow up on the on the trauma piece, when looking at some of the materials, you know, it's there was a relationship to the built environment and how some of this understanding is being used in, in architecture, which has me thinking as you're talking, because earlier you mentioned intercepts. So, you know, when you are doing something like an intercept or something in context, are you taking any kind of specific you know, precautions uh, so as to not re-traumatize in that kind of environment? So that's a great question. I think that's something we're still working through. So like an example of an intercept might be going to, uh, for me, a, an expungement clinic. Honestly, we have tried to do things in the past, but the reality is that so much of our work and really embrace of the trauma framework has come uh, in the lead up to and during COVID. Mm -hmm. So for safety reasons, we haven't been doing intercepts or a lot of in-person stuff. I can, mm -hmm. one of my colleagues has written about doing some face-to-face -face research, socially distanced around our, uh, our SNAP tool, Get Cal Fresh. But I think that's going to be something that as we begin doing research in person, we're going to have to think through a little bit more and, and most likely do some additional training in the team and really, really think through what that looks like uh, beyond just looking for markers, ensuring that however we're doing it is not ever making an individual feel trapped by what we're doing. Again, I think some of that may also come down to really asking where are intercepts necessary, where are intercepts helpful, versus is there a different way that we could be working with people in, in in person that brings them a little bit more into the research and design process? And we're doing a bit of experimenting with ideas around that right now. Okay. And since you are uh, mostly conducting remote research, I'd be curious to get, you know, to hear your experience on that, you know, and, and in comparison to, you know, as you say, the before times, um, Obviously, you know, the type of remote research we all do is different. And so it, you know, it requires you know, different actions from all of us, uh, the way we approach that. But in maybe broadly speaking, not so much, you know, with the participants you're working with and the fact that, you know, there's potential for re-traumatization, but just in general, what have you learned by doing remote research compared to, you know, the before times and in context? Yeah, it's... um. A lot of my career has historically had to be remote research, especially when you're working with industrials or multinational organizations, just because folks are spread across the, the globe or even just across the U.S. And sometimes you'll get a client who's willing to do like a whirlwind bar barnstorming trip. I've been on my, my fair share of those, but a lot of times, um, especially working in design, one of the challenges is that the agency and the client wants to reserve as much of their uh, budget for the design part. And so research, I don't want to say it gets the short end, but it definitely often works on a more reduced budget. I think the, the biggest challenges are always trying to figure out how do you, how do you build rapport? Um, and rapport is a challenging word, but like when, um, you're dealing with uh, less channels. So face-to-face, -face, you can at least get a sense of, of things sometimes, but definitely phone-based phone stuff, both in terms of recruiting and 
and conducting interviews can be a real challenge. Uh, it's also funny, like, I feel like the amount of Zooming we have been doing, all of us, I have found that my phone skills <laughs> have, like, severely degraded uh, over the course of the pandemic. So occasionally, like, I very rarely call people anymore. Um, and it's funny how you sometimes get out of practice. Like, it's it's awkward enough getting off of a Zoom call, but I find, like, phone ending phone conversations has been a real challenge for me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm not... I'm not sure I've got um, more that I can say about that. I I also think, and you know, this is this is definitely something for me. Is as I mentioned, this last year has really been learning how to interface and conduct respectful research with a community that's very different than the communities I've researched in before. And I think that that's definitely an area where. Um, starting that purely remote has been a bit challenging because you don't you don't get a chance to learn some of the same things that you do when you get a chance to, to spend time with folks in person and trying to figure out how to um, be authentic under all of these structures and challenges that we're facing right now is is really tough sure so uh, maybe last question on this and then we can maybe just pivot back to um, mm -hmm. the volunteering but you mentioned you're interested in being more participatory. And I, you know, in your case, assume that frequently when we hear that, you know, people are thinking participatory design, but of course, we're probably more so speaking participatory research in, and design, of course, you know, mm -hmm. obviously both ends of it. But for the sake of this context, I'd be curious to know, like, you know, how, what's that looking like for you? Is that you and, and uh, you know, any given participant, or is that you and a series of stakeholders, including state actors, you know, non-state but system-based, you know, like agency actors, you know, is is that are you looking at the whole ecosystem, or or just those that have been impacted by the state? So, um, from a research perspective, we're pro I think we're um, so one of the key things about Code for America's practice is we do try to center community members because. So often uh, in doing service design in on government systems, it begins with the government actors and then maybe the community-based organizations. And typically the actual folks on the ground are often the have the least amount of consultation and involvement in the process. So depending on the challenge, we'll shift the type of participatory we're thinking about. If we're trying to do community research, uh, again, one of the things that my... Uh, Again, my, co my, my colleague Aditi has been working on is um, bringing on community consultants who are trained to conduct research, who we treat, again, and that's why they're called consultants. They are compensated for this. They're, it's not just simply asking them to do free research within their community, but often um, for incarcerated folks, they have networks of people that we don't have access to. They can talk with folks within their network in a way that we can't. Mm -hmm. So thinking through what that can look like, whether that's we train them and they'll go conduct research and work with us uh, together on the synthesis process to we are in a more cooperative place where we're crafting questions together. They might serve as a note taker for me. I might serve as a note taker for them. Again, our goal would is to try and involve them within the synthesis and design process in different pieces. And scaling from there, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to appreciate, especially as Code for America increasingly works in more states uh, across the country, is you can't, um, our ability to spend time in communities is severely limited. And so I don't want to be, and uh, no, no one on the team wants to be kind of the parachute researcher who comes in, does a very superficial study of the community and then pull and then heads out or hands off a report that to a large degree is, is repeating what CBOs and other groups have already said. So at that point, it's like thinking, and, and it could be folks within the community, it could be with our CBOs and other partners, what does it look like to conduct that research together? And then ultimately, um, our qualitative research team is situated within the organization's broader service design team to actually redesign services together. And I think as we move towards, the, uh, depending on the project, the services we're, re we're redesigning, 
then that will shift in some cases that may involve government folks in other cases that might not just kind of depending on the solution space we're looking at. Yeah, got it. Great. So to, to now come back to the earlier topic of volunteering. So you said, you know, you have a particular uh, interest or, you know, belief about the need to volunteer. And I'd like to hear about that and then you know, use that probably to pivot towards resumes and portfolios, because of mm -hmm. course, volunteering gives you the kind of projects that then you can talk about and show in, you know, in those assets. So would you mind sharing, you know, why you, your perspective is, is that people should volunteer? I think people should volunteer, should consider volunteering. Um, I think th you should also be very careful to try and figure out what and this is going to sound very mercenary, but what you're looking to get out of a volunteering experience, like what types of pieces, and then do some time limiting around this. Uh, the reason that I say that is uh, it's very easy for volunteer opportunities, and, and this is also doing work for free for commercial organizations. Sure. On the one side, it's like, okay, great, I can get some portfolio materials, I can learn something that I don't know right now. On the other side, it's very easy, especially with mission-driven organizations and causes, for that to shift into an exp exploitative relationship. And there are two issues with that. One is that um, simply people should be self-protective, and that's part of a self-care routine, is to make sure that you're thinking about those things. Additionally, it's also worth noting that, um, especially, and, and I've known folks in the past who've done free things for companies is that it also, having been a freelancer myself, risks driving down the value of our work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's trying to figure out what is the right level of engagement that you're getting enough in return to justify the the amount of exper uh, the amount of your time that's going into that. And like I said, I think getting a solid portfolio piece out of that is something that can be done or, or getting that experience or getting access to a larger network, uh, keeping skills fresh. But also at some point, it's also asking yourself, you know, is this really advancing things? Or in, in uh, a different case, am I potentially taking paying a work away from somebody else? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, something else? Um. No, I think that that's it on, on that. So how does that relate in, it's, this is a debate I have with a lot of people or, or a conversation I have with a lot of people. So, you know, I am of the belief that, you know, in absence of other ways to get the experience, whether that's an internship, mm -hmm. you know, or a job, right? You know, some, some entry level job, whatever it may be, or, or courses, applied mm -hmm. courses. In absence of that, I'm a fan of, you know, figuring out what you need to do to get the portfolio piece. Yeah. Um, but how do you feel about other suggestions that exist out there, you know, boot camps, certificates, whatever it may be? Great question. Um, so first, the best time to start thinking about the transition process is still when you're in school. Um, the reality is that there are some options available to you that go beyond just simply internships. So, so for example, um, there is Coding It Forward, which is an organization that will allow, uh, that, that places folks who are in, in, still in school in semester long uh, experiences within uh, different government organizations. They've just expanded the program so, so non-citizens can participate in it, which is great. Uh, yeah, sure. So, the more that you can look into those and take advantage of those while you're still uh, in school, it's just going to make things a little bit easier. Unfortunately, and it's uh, the way that things are, once you leave school, then things become more challenging. Yeah. I am personally not a fan of boot camps. There are some good ones out there. If you're, if you're looking, you can potentially find them. Unfortunately, in my experience, most of them, uh, many of them, have great instructors, but still end up falling into a um, more of a for-profit 
college model where there are often promises about placement that don't happen, uh, that, that are not met at the end of things. And honestly, at that point, and this is a really difficult thing to say to somebody who might have just completed a PhD program, it's almost considering a two-year master's program in the field at a, at a, at a school that one will teach you the language and two has recruiting mechanisms into industries may make more sense Mm -hmm. um, in terms of an ultimate return on investment. It's a challenge in that respect. Um, I think certificate programs, I personally think are better than boot camps. uh, But again, you have to appreciate and really look for ones that are in a, in a price range that makes sense. Uh, and then what's the, what are you exiting it from? So like, for example, the Nielsen Norman one is really great, but it's also one that everybody does. It's a pretty fast camp, which means you're going to, you're really to some degree paying for the certificate versus some academic ones that might take a number of more months might actually be cheaper. And in my mind, you're probably exiting with better, better pieces as well. The other thing I'm still a firm believer in is spending some time with whatever your your dissertation research is and really thinking through, is there portfolio stuff in there? Because I, I'll tell you that I think there often is. Yeah. One of the challenges I that, uh, and this is where academic education and, and that mindset I don't think serves folks well, is there's such a desire to think about the ethnography, assuming it it was an ethnographic project as this huge thing, because you're kind of writing it up that way. But the reality, and this is something um, that I hit me attending an epic. I, I for years resisted using ethnography to describe my methods. Uh, I would use ethnographically inspired. And somebody pointed out that really an ethnography isn't an ethnography. It's a promiscuous, series of small research engagements that are on a trajectory. And so I, I've often found working with people that if they look very hard at their research, you can actually spin out, here's the interviewing section, here's the participant observation section, here are these other pieces. And you're able to, if you work on it, crafting each of those into a single research engagement that you can talk about as part of a larger tra- trajectory but is more of a portfolio piece than you might realize when you're initially looking at it as, you know, my entire publication. Yeah. Which also allows you to tell a very nice story of, you know, where did you start? Where did you end up? Right. And in the project management along the way, you know, including things like, you know, recruiting and, you know, the skills mm-hmm. like that, you know, budgeting, estimating, if you will, right. All those kind Completely. of skills that in business are really relevant. So totally. I think the, the, the other challenge that you'll often see, people in presenting that, and, and I can also relate this even to my career trajectory, is that um, when doing the portfolio or doing the job talk, folks often get really, really excited about talking about the domain space, because that's what we've been acclimated to do. Mm-hmm. But really, it's more about when you're doing a portfolio or a job talk in industry, it's giving me a sense of how do you approach a problem? What are the methodologies you use? How do you convey that information? How do you, what is all that meta work? So I don't actually care particularly about specifically the industry you're working in or even necessarily the outcome. It's more helping me get a sense of what does it feel like to work with you? Mm -hmm. And I would also say that that's something to keep in mind for the first few years of your career. Um, Like I, I, I always try to encourage people to treat their first job as a as hopefully a better paying postdoc, which is that you're not trying to find an organization that you're going to work at for more than two years. And additionally, you're not even trying to find the domain piece. Like I, granted, I've gone through a lot of careers, but even if we just take it to my research, my, my modern design research career, the first three to four years of that career, we're working across lots of domain spaces it's only been now that I'm more of an established uh, professional and and have have developed the the base skills that I've really been able to make the decision I'm going to concentrate in the mm-hmm. civic design and civic technology space and the criminal legal system space. Skills come before domain, 
more often than not in this area. And so that's, uh, that's something to think about as well, both in the way you're presenting as well as, as you're thinking about your first few jobs. Yeah, it's, it's great input. So since you look at, um, yeah, you're talking about, uh, you were just talking about how, you know, you're interested in how people really communicate their process in many ways, how they think about the problem. So what are you looking for, you know, in a resume or in a portfolio, you know, to, to see that? Because, you know, once you're in the interview, then you have the opportunity to verbalize that. But in the textual form, how are you looking to see that? Yeah. Um, so a couple things. Honestly, I, and I was awful at writing grant, grant proposals. That's probably why, one of the many reasons why my PhD didn't work out well. But there was something that I, that I was told and resisted, again, why I was awful at writing grant proposals, which is that a grant proposal should never be creative. <laughs> a grant proposal should basically make it as easy as possible for the person reviewing the grant proposal to, to see why you should get the grant, which means reflecting most of their language back at them. Um, and uh, as a general rule, like for a recent more senior position, we screened 200 plus resumes to begin with. And so I at most could give each of those resumes maybe two minutes of time. So I'm looking for catchphrases. I'm looking for specific types of, uh, of um, looking for specific types of experience, and almost all of them have been indicated in the job description. Same thing with the cover letter. Definitely read them, but it's it's kind of... If you do something incredibly creative, sometimes that will make a difference. So I can tell you that the best cover letter I ever got was, uh, we hired her, um, was for our UX designer at Measures for Justice, uh, Carly Simmons, and I, I love this one. Her, her, her letter was a, a, a Venn diagram of her skills, the problem space, and my organization's needs, and how they all converged in the center. And I was just like, this was perfect. If... <laughs> If it had not been that perfect, it probably also would have gone onto the onto the um, the reject pile. Mm -hmm. So if if you can come up with something that brilliant and uh, and consider that that can work in your advantage, but often anything that's hard to scan, hard to read, hard to parse is probably not going to make it past the two minute test. And honestly, in some cases, it's probably the first scan is about thirty seconds, and then if it looks good, I'll then move into that. For a portfolio piece, um, the thing to remember with all of this is, again, scannability. I may be looking at a website now for about maybe five minutes uh, if you've got an online portfolio, which means I need to be able to quickly see uh, and find the where your experience is. And I am not going to be in any type of deep reading mode. I'm, I'm really getting a sense... And the key thing to remember about the meta aspect of all this process is throughout all of this, you're being judged on how well you can tell your own story because that lets me know how well you can effectively tell the stories of the folks that you're working with or the my organization story or your project story. So it's like very quickly seeing what are the methods being used? What are some examples of this? How well does this person shift from a macro level telling the entire trajectory of, of this to maybe a micro level? So something I always try to do is maybe pull out one super short anecdote that gets a sense of how that might come uh, come into play. Or the, um, also what artifacts are coming out of the research. But if I if any of those sections is more than a paragraph, you're probably going to start losing me. If the page is an extreme long scan, that again is probably one that I'm going to abandon about halfway through the page. Um, so keeping in mind that you're making it TLDR friendly, too long, didn't read, uh, is kind of critical in all of this stuff. And each step you progress through the interview process. So stage one for a tech organization might be a recruiter who is doing the initial scan of the resumes. We don't do that at Code for America. We do re we do review the resume. We have subject matter experts review the resume, but for the recruiter, it's basically 
Do they hit X, Y, and Z? Okay, yes, move them to the next stage, which would probably be the recruiter call, where again, you're talking to somebody who isn't a domain expert, but just getting a sense of getting some stuff checked off. Then they get would get passed to somebody who's more now a domain-specific spe- person who's going to give the longer, deeper read. And it's kind of each one is just having enough information to advance you to the next step. Yeah, great. And then um, in terms of the uh, the actual interview, so you know the document. Well, let me also just say for anybody listening, right? It, it you should view the resume right as many as like our own project in which we're iterating mm-hmm. on it, right? We're, we're sort yes. of learning, right? If you're not getting a response, you're tweaking it. You're sending it back out, seeing how is that getting you, you know, more call, you know, more replies from the recruiter or, or who, who, the first tier, mm-hmm. if you will. And just constantly iterating to the point where you now you're in the door, you have an interview, and then you have the opportunity to speak about your work. And as you said, you know, you're listening to see how they tell really the story of, of this work because it helps you understand how well they're going to be able to communicate uh, really the stories of the, the participants that we're researching with, which is a really nice way to say it. Is there anything else in, you know, in the interview that you would be looking for? Um, a few things. It, you know... If it's a if it's a job talk, time management is actually a critical one, and and um, we'll, we try to be pretty transparent about what we expect in terms of that presentation to be. And if if I have to interrupt uh, somebody who's giving a job talk to say we need to move on to questions, and they're not through their story yet, that will be a that's never a good sign. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I, I recommend folks to do is embrace appendix slides. So uh, I think that there's all, uh, and again, I think a lot of this comes out of a certain defensiveness that is often built in academia. Um, so, you know, I, I know for at least myself, I'm very good at picking apart my own arguments or knowing where I'm going to need supporting material. But I would much rather put those in an appendix rather than build them into the talk. So if it does come up, I can show that I've done the pre-work, I've been thinking in that way, but it's not part of the core telling of the story. And Mm -hmm. so I think that that becomes a really important thing there. A second thing is you really do need to do research on the organization that you're working with. Uh, And again, um, there are two things here. One, I love your point about um, tweaking your resume and keep sending it out. And, and this gets back to, especially for your first job, embracing it as a first job, not where you're trying to get tenure. So that means, and, and, and I can speak about this, you know, in, in the respect that when I started to make the transition, when I made the transition to Measures for Justice, I was sending out resumes to a lot of places. So I, I, by that point, I, I decided I was enjoying working for myself, but it wasn't it, it was more than I wanted to continue doing. So I had a lot of interviews that got to the final stage and I did not get them. And that I learned a lot from that process that ultimately really changed my approach. So, I mean, you can't wait to try and develop your entire pitch on the perfect job. Uh, that's just a very, very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> um, one of the things that I learned along those lines was... Uh, one, if they're, especially let's say you're going for a big tech organization like uh, Microsoft or an Amazon or Google, Facebook, lean into the recruiters. Their job is to get people into positions. So they are going to be a lot of help. Um, be prepared to understand the format of an organization's interviews. So like with um, Amazon at the time I interviewed with them, it was like the star thing. It was like, it was a type of behavioral interviewing Mm-hmm. and practice the heck out of delivering stuff in that way. I did not do enough practice. And I had a moment in the second interview where I just could not communicate with the hiring manager. And it was like, that was the moment that I knew I was not going to get the job. Um, and so it's, it, those are some of the pieces as well. Um, I think making sure you've got some good questions to ask back during the interview is always a great technique, but also appreciating that often, um, especially, and again, uh, Code for America is a tech organization, is that you'll often get these, you've got 45 minutes with an individual 
And the reality is everybody's got to ask the same series of questions so that they can get answers to them to discuss your ability to hire. So it's almost like making it as easy as possible for them to get through what they have to do mm -hmm. in that 45 minutes so that you can have other questions. And um, again, the more that you make it harder for them to do what's being asked of them, the less chance uh, you're going to have for, you know, to get the position. Yeah, great. All right. Well, um, Matt, that's all really wonderful, very practical advice. So thanks for that. In closing, is there anything, you know, that you want to mention that hasn't come up that, you know, you'd just like to publicize, whether it's anything else with Code for America, you know, I know you're involved in Epic, you name it, you, you, yep. your floor. Yeah. Well, uh, again, big plug for Epic, for folks who are looking for volunteer opportunities, uh, local code for America brigades, as well as the, the U.S. digital response are great places to look at. I want to also put in a plug um, to get everyone thinking about trauma-informed approach, approaches. And one of the, the things I firmly believe is that the reality is we're all going through an incredibly traumatic period due to COVID-19. And my I believe is that a lot of spaces where topics like trauma have not historically come up when doing, let's say, studying sideways work, there's a good chance that there's going to be a lot of that coming up unexpectedly in the next few years. You could be asking a question, um, especially because the home has been broken down in so many ways for so many people that it's the home office and also the school and all these other pieces. And so I think we're going to be, I, I know for myself, discovering unexpected um, landmines where you could be asking a question or, or thinking about something that has nothing to do with, in you know, a traditional sense, trauma, and suddenly discover somebody has a reaction that was completely unexpected. And much the same way that I, I said you don't want to try and um, figure out what to do in your perfect job interview, um, you don't want to try and figure out at that point, how do you handle a situation like that? So I think it's a really important thing to think through in the work. Um, beyond that, I uh, will, one of the things I've been working on is a community curated list of resources originally started out specifically for um, moving from Anthro into UX, but it's increasingly growing to include things like um, alternative models to design thinking, uh, pathways into civic tech and civic design. So I'm also going to provide that link um, and let Matt uh, put that up as well. And if folks have any questions, reach out. Um, my schedule is pretty busy, but I still try to respond to everything. It might take a little bit of time, but, uh, you know, I there are opp opportunities out there. They are going to take a while, but it is possible to make this transition. Yeah, and, absolutely. Not but. And it is possible to make this trans transition. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, so you said people can reach out. So where's the best place for them to reach out? Um, well, uh, typically via email, or if you join, for example, the Ethnography Hangout on Slack um, or any of the other channels that I'm on, just drop me a note there. And um, un unfortunately, Fortunately, Epic is going to be remote again this year. Uh, it's a bummer because we all want to see each other, but on the plus side, it is also means that the, um, the, the cost of entry is going to be lower. So definitely consider that. Also, Code for America's Summit will be happening this year uh, in May. And uh, if you get your ticket in March, it's only $25. If you're interested in the civic tech space, especially, it's a great conference. I'm also seeing about organizing something around uh, UX and UX research uh, around that. So if everything works out, there may be some other opportunities to have some conversations in that space too. Great. Very exciting. Well, Matt, thanks again. Appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, you as well. This was absolutely a pleasure. Thank you all for listening to the Anthro to UX podcast. To learn everything you need to break into UX, visit anthrotous.com. There you will find all the podcast episodes and career coaching resources. Please like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.